Welcome to this practice question session for biology. In this video, we'll be going through questions one to five. So question one is asking us, which of the following would be affected if the protein actin was mutated? So we're talking about actin and we're talking about it being mutated. So if there was a problem in the protein actin, which of these functions would be affected? For this, you need to know actin and its different roles in a cell. And so if actin does play a role in whatever process we're talking about, then that process will be affected. So option one that is saying cellular shape, is actin involved in this? Yes, it is, because cellular shape is determined mainly due to the cytoskeleton of a cell. And the cytoskeleton, a main part of that is actin. So it's mainly composed of actin, this protein. And so if our cytoskeleton is affected, the cell's shape is going to be affected. So that is definitely something that's going to change. Mitosis as well is going to be affected because if you know all the different parts of mitosis, at one point we have the mitotic spindle coming out and pulling apart the different strands of DNA. So that process with the mitotic spindle has actin as a main component. And so actin does play a role in mitosis as well. So because of that, we can say that mitosis will be affected as well because the mitotic spindle can't properly form and function if actin is mutated. And then finally, muscle contraction. Yes, that should be like the first place where your mind goes when we're talking about actin because muscle contraction that relies on thin and thick filaments, which are composed of actin and myosin. So muscle contraction is due to actin and myosin coming together, binding, and then myosin pulling on the actin threat, the actin strands so because of that muscle contraction is also going to be affected if actin is mutated so therefore the correct answer here is going to be d because we're going to say all of these different functions of the cell are affected in question two it says the functions of the corpus luteum include what so corpus luteum what is this this is related to the reproductive cycle in females the corpus luteum is what the follicle around the ovary becomes once the ovary has been secreted. So once that ovum is secreted, then the follicle around it becomes a corpus luteum. And you should know that after that event, after ovulation, the main function of the corpus luteum is to secrete the hormone progesterone. Why does it secrete progesterone? It does it so that the endometrial lining is maintained because otherwise if this corpus luteum is not secreting progesterone, the endometrial lining is shedded, and that's what's called a period. But if that egg happens to be fertilized, then the egg needs a place to, to attach. And so it needs to attach in the endothelial lining and get all of its nutrients and all of that in that location wherever it attaches. So progesterone is secreted by the corpus luteum to make sure that the endometrial lining is not shedded. So let's look for that, that option. A is saying its function is the abortion of the fetus in the case of genetic anomalies. No, that is not what the corpus luteum does. B is saying the ejection of an oocyte from the ovary. That's not its role specifically. It comes about after ejection of the oocyte from the ovary. C is saying the growth and maturation of additional oocytes within the ovary no, it's related to just one oocyte. And then D is saying maintaining the lining of the endometrium. Yes, that's what we were that's what we were discussing. So once again, just know that that the corpus luteum secretes progesterone and then the function of that progesterone is to maintain the endometrium so that our growing zygote has a place to get nutrients and stay attached. Now in question three, we're talking about single nucleotide polymorphisms. Where are they expected to be most abundant? So SNPs, what they are is a single change in the DNA sequence where one nucleotide is switched for another. And this occurs in, it occurs in people at a, at a level that it is significant. So if it was just a very rare mutation, like less than 1% it's present in a population, then it wouldn't be that relevant, but single nucleotide polymorphisms, they are greater than 1% in the population, and so they are 
important. And so that could be, for example, if I have an allele that codes for some protein and at a certain region, I have a C. In that same region, someone else has an A. So just that C has been replaced by an A. So a single nucleotide was changed, but we're asked where are they expected to be most found. So if someone has this mutation and it is prevalent in society, then that must mean that this mutation doesn't lead to a drastic change. Because if, if both of us, we have this difference in a part of our genome that's coding for an important protein, well, we both have to, at the end, have this protein, right? If it's an important protein, we both need this protein to be formed. And so the nucleotide change, it can't be something which drastically changes the coding of the protein so that it's not formed properly because both of us do actually end up forming the final product whether we're talking about a protein or anything else we do form the final product and so it's not that drastic a mutation so therefore the place that we expect this mutation to be found is a place which isn't really coding for that protein it's just like a non-coding part of the genome so a is saying the exons of genes that's not correct because the exons of genes exit the nucleus and they are part of the coding part of the genome. B is saying the non-coding regions of DNA. Yes, that is where we expect them to be found because if you have a mutation there, it can still persist and carry on in society and be prevalent, but it doesn't lead to a major change in the product. And so it doesn't make a non-functional protein. Otherwise, that would be too drastic a change and then we wouldn't expect these mutations to be that abundant. C is saying interior protein domains of cytosolic proteins. No, they don't happen in the domain of a protein. They happen in, because we're talking about nucleotide polymorphisms, they happen in the DNA. That's where nucleotides are. And then D is saying highly conserved domains of metabolic proteins. Okay, if in C and D, if we're talking about the genome that codes for either the interior domain, the interior part of the cytosolic protein, or a highly conserved part that codes for a protein. In either of these, we don't expect a mutation to occur or be really abundant because that would change the function of the protein. So if we had a part of the genome that codes for the interior part of a cytosolic protein, then if there's a mutation there, that's gonna change the protein. And the same thing with something that's highly conserved. If something is highly conserved, that means that between me and the other person, between someone who had a C in that position and someone who had an A, they would both have that same, they would have the same like DNA sequence in the highly conserved region because this region is very important and so it's highly conserved between all people and there isn't a drastic change because if there was, then the, the mutation would most likely lead to a non-functional protein. So definitely we don't expect to see a mutation in a highly conserved domain. And the part that we do expect it to appear in is a non-coding region because once again, that won't have a drastic effect on the final protein product and it can carry on being transmitted throughout different generations. In question four, it says a mutation occurs which prevents myelin formation in the peripheral nervous system. It can therefore be assumed that what? So we are preventing myelin from being formed. So we do not have myelin. And then we're told that it occurs in the peripheral nervous system. So for this, you should know that what is myelin? What is its function? And then also what's the difference between the peripheral and the central nervous system? So in the peripheral nervous system, we have Schwann cells. Those are the ones that make myelin. And then in the central nervous system, we have oligodendrocytes, which make the myelin. And the function of the myelin is it wraps around the axons in the nervous system. And it does have some gaps in between called the nodes of Ranvier, where we have the different ion channels. And then because of this, we get saltatory conduction. And what myelin ends up doing is it speeds up the rate at which a signal is transmitted across the axon. So if you have an action potential at the front, and then we have a myelinated, myelinated versus a non-myelinated axon, the one which does have a myelin sheet is going to transmit or conduct that signal much quicker. So that's what myelination does. So let's see what happens when we get rid of myelination. A is saying these axons have fewer sodium potassium channels 
than regular neurons. And no, this isn't true because myelin is just something which wraps around the axon. It doesn't change the amount of channels we have. We still have the same amount of channels. It's just that now the channels are more so in the nodes of RANVA rather than just being everywhere along the axon. But myelin formation does not affect the number of channels. B is saying this individual has decreased quantity of oligodendrocytes. So because they said oligodendrocytes, that makes this option incorrect. We can assume that they have a decreased quantity of Schwann cells, but not oligodendrocytes once again, because oligodendrocytes are for the central nervous system. We're told this is in the peripheral one. C is saying the axons have increased conduction velocity. No, that is backwards. They would have decreased conduction velocity, so they would conduct signals at a slower rate now because they don't have this myelin wrapped around. And then D is saying the axons induce identical amplitude action potentials as normal neurons. That is correct. So we're saying the amplitude of the action potentials is identical. Yeah, that's true. Even when you have a myelin around an axon, it doesn't change the amplitude of an action potential. So the action potential, it's always going to have the same threshold for an action potential to occur in a given set of neurons. And so it's always going to be activated at that threshold and it's always going to go up to whatever voltage it gets depolarized at, the maximum voltage, and then it's going to come back down and then get repolarized. That, that action potential amplitude, how high it goes or how, how low it goes, the voltage, is going to be the same. And it's always the same in an action potential in a given type of cell. And it doesn't matter whether we have myelin wrapped around or not. So yeah, we can still say that we're going to get equal amplitude action potentials as a normal neuron. In question five, we're asked which of the following is false regarding desmosomes. So desmosomes are a type of protein which will link together two cells very closely. So it's going to link them together by binding to parts of their cytoskeleton. So now their cytoskeletons are bound together. So these cells are very closely held together. And the reason that they exist, their purpose is to have different layers of tissues be bound together very very closely and very tightly so that it can reduce the effect of any shearing. So desmosomes are pretty present in the epithelium. For example, in the epithelium of your intestines, there are going to be desmosomes which keep the epithelial layer very tightly bound to that basement layer at the bottom because we're going to see a lot of churning, movement, also like attack by enzymes and basic conditions in the intestines. So all of that is going to have a lot of wear and tear on the epithelial layer. So because of this wear and tear, uh, the desmosomes hold the epithelial layer tightly together. So that is their purpose. A is saying they contain protein structures. That's correct. So it's not something that's false. Yeah, they are like proteins which hold different cells together by binding to the cytoskeleton. That's correct. B is saying they allow tissues to resist shear forces as in the epithelium. Yeah, that's their main role. So they can hold these, these cells tightly together to resist shear forces or just a lot of wear and tear. C is saying they contain pores for direct cell-to-cell -cell communication through the cytoplasm. That is something that's false about des desmosomes. So that would be talking about gap junctions or different types of channels. So desmosomes, their main, their main function is to hold cells together. They aren't involved in transmitting something from one cell to another. So they, they are not a channel. They're not open in between and they don't allow, allow transport. That is not their function. Their function is just to hold the cells together. So C is something that's incorrect. It's talking about gap junctions. And then D is saying they can be found in epithelial tissues. Yes, we said that is one place where they are pretty abundant. So C is the correct answer for question five. So that's it for the questions for this video. And once again, we want to remind you that we have a link in the description for our full course. If you enjoyed what you saw in this video, if you enjoyed going through questions and seeing the correct answer and then also why other answers are incorrect, then make sure to check out our course. We do this for a lot of questions in all the different sections of the MCAT. So if you go through our course, you're going to be guaranteed at least a 510 on the MCAT.